That music is way cooler than I am, so. Good morning. I'm <laughs> glad you're here today. Oh. Believe it or not, we're in the 37th week of the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, it's just unbelievable uh, the, the richness of this Gospel, and uh, as we spend time with it, just the things that we're learning about Jesus, but also learning about our world and ourselves. And uh, if you remember and you were here last week, uh, uh, you know that it ended with a series of, of parables where Jesus is asking a question in each parable. And uh, it was a provocative set of parables and, and people were a little put off by it. And the result is, is that now people who usually don't have a lot of use for each other have a common enemy in Jesus. He's, he's frustrated them, he's, he's embarrassed them, he's turned the tables on them, and so now people who would usually keep their distance from each other have gathered to each other because they have a common enemy in Jesus. And we pick up the story in Matthew 22, beginning in verse 15. It says, the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words, talking about Jesus. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity, that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, how many know that a conversation that starts with those two words? Really difficult. Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and, and he asked them, whose image is on this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed so they left him and went away. Uh, they try to set up Jesus with a little bit of flattery. Uh, people still attempt to do that from time to time. And uh, they'll tell you how good you are at something just to get you to do it again. And so they, they try to set Jesus up. But what's interesting is what they're asking for is not just an opinion, though the word is there. Is it right to pay the imperial tax? And the goal is not to understand more about this. The goal is for Jesus to weigh in. And they're looking for Jesus to create a controversy. And uh, how many know our world is kind of controversy dependent these days? Uh, it's hard to, to pay attention to anything unless it's controversial. And, and here's the thing you need to know about controversy. It's always, it's always about disagreement. Always. Now somebody said, well, that, no, I, I talked to somebody and I agreed with them. Yes, but they want you to disagree with somebody else. That's how it works. And so they come to Jesus and they're asking a question that's a loaded question because if Jesus says, yes, you should pay the tax, then all the Jewish people that are around there are going to be frustrated because Rome has occupied their territory. They've taken over. And what they are requiring is that you economically support their system with taxes. And so that would cause Jesus to lose favor. But if he says you should not pay the taxes, then you should know that puts you on a very short leash. In fact, when Jesus was just a boy, there was a man by the name of Judas who started a tax revolt against Rome. And Rome didn't put up with that for half a minute. They littered the entire country with crosses of people who supported that idea, with people hanging on them. Now, this is what happens when you don't pay your taxes. And so they're trying to put Jesus in a no-win situation. And Jesus doesn't respond the way that they want. What he does is he says, so show me the coin you pay your taxes with. And oddly enough, Jesus didn't have that coin, but they did. The currency they claim to hate is the very currency they trade in. And he asked them, they're, they're in the court of the Gentiles, this is part of the temple, and, and, and he asked them whose image is on that. And you have to know, in the Old Testament, there were some very strict rules of not bringing any image into the temple. So they're starting to feel uncomfortable, and, and they said, Caesar's. And he says, and whose inscription? 
and, and it's Caesar's. And if you don't know what the inscription is, we actually have coins. They found them in archaeology. And this is the inscription that was written on the back of the coin. Son of God, high priest. Uh, back in the ancient world, if you were a political leader, that was considered the equivalent of a god. And what you need to know is that's how Caesar thought of himself. That's who he believed. And this is what Jesus basically says. Then you better pay back Caesar in his own coin. Almost sounds revolutionary. And so now people are... They're perplexed. He's not answering the question the way that they wanted him to. And, and, and here's the thing that Jesus knows. Rome provided some things, right? They provided roads. They provided educated, education. They provided defense so that other nations couldn't attack and invade. And what Rome expected in return was economic support in the form of taxes. And Jesus says, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give back to God what is God's. Give to Caesar what bears his image. What bears God's image? You do. You were created in the image and the likeness of God. Give back to God what belongs to God. Our view of God's kingdom changes our perspective on other kingdoms. I can tell by a lot of the conversations in our culture today that there's not a lot of understanding of God's kingdom. There's a lot of very important priority being placed on human kingdoms. And Jesus is letting his hearers know there's not just one kingdom. I know Rome thinks they're the only kingdom. Give to Caesar what is Caesar, but there's another kingdom. Give to God what is God's. And what he's telling us is, is that the state should be honored, but no state is perfect. The state should also be limited. We don't give to the state what belongs to God. Well, what is that exactly? Well, for example, our worship. There is a, a passage in Acts 5 where the state tried to impose on the disciples. They said, you can't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And they said, so you, you tell us, should we obey God or should we obey you? There may come a moment where we have to go against the request of the state because the state is trying to take authority that belongs only to God. But in this situation, when it comes to paying taxes, Jesus did not say that that was beyond the state's right. He says, honor the state. So, do you pay your taxes? Don't raise your hands. Do you pay all your taxes? Don't raise your hands. I went online to find out what percentage of people cheat on their income tax. And the answer is we don't know because they won't tell us. <laughs> Get back to Caesar. That's actually a command. Get back to Caesar. What is Caesar's? Uh, then they go into another controversy. The next group moves in. By the way, that was the, the Pharisees and the Herodians. And the Herodians had, had supported the paying of taxes. So these two people who hated each other are together. And now the Sadducees come in and it says the, the same day the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now there were seven brothers among us and the first one married and died. And since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. And the same thing happened to the second and the third brother, right down to the seventh. Like after the sixth brother and you're the seventh brother, aren't you just looking at your parents going, please, no, don't make me do it. <laughs> Finally, the woman died. Now, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? And Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. 
they will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. The Sadducees start asking questions, and if you don't know who the Sadducees are, they're the sophisticated people, they're aristocratic, they love Greek culture because of its sophistication. They actually collaborated with Roman culture because they love power, they love pleasure. When you don't believe in an afterlife, you better get what you can in this life. And they only accepted as scripture the first five books of the Bible, which is the Torah, the, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They did not believe anything else was scripture. And they believed that when your body died, your soul died too. That was it. It was over. That was the end. They reduced spirituality in terms of what was possible, but also to just rules and to culture. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They were kind of the modernists of their day. Now, the main passages, not the only, but the main passages in the Old Testament that support the idea of resurrection are found in Daniel, Isaiah, Job, and Ezekiel. There's lots of other references, but those were the main ones. And of course, they didn't accept those as scripture. And so they, they, they created this argument that was intended to make the resurrection sound silly. Uh, one bride for seven brothers. And, and none of them survived the experience. I don't know why. I'm not here to judge. And to be fair, she died too. Um, what they want to do is they want to make it sound silly. Isn't that what people do today? When you want to demean a position, just make it sound silly. And, and there was a, a rule that they did believe in, though it it's, uh, was not widely practiced. And it's found in Deuteronomy, the 25th chapter. And the rule that, that God had given was, if a man died and he had a wife and no children, that that wife would become that man's brother's wife. And there were reasons behind that. And it had to do with the fact that that man had had property. And so if he had no children, then his line would be more or less, it would, it would be eliminated. That, that line would no longer exist. That lineage would no longer exist. And so what they would do is the brother would bring that wife in as a wife. And in case you're wondering, but what if he already has a wife? Now he's got two wives. See how quiet it got? <laughs> and so, so, but why would he do that? And the answer is because that inheritance was supposed to go to that brother's children, not just to somebody else. And so they, they create and they fabricate this story that makes it sound a little bit silly. And, and so the answer is whose wife? And Jesus says, you are in error. The, the literal meaning of that is you are being led astray. What are they being led astray by? And the answer is two things. First of all, they don't know the scriptures. Secondly, they don't know the power of God. God's word and God's power inform us about how things could be and how things will be. And if we don't know God's word and we don't know God's power, we're going to wind up going down paths we would prefer not to go. And so there's just some things they don't know. And, uh, and, and when you think about it, they don't have an incentive to really change anything in their lives or in the world because the system was working for them. Like if the system works for you, leave it alone, let it be. And, and if you talk about eternal life, that could upset. Like if there's something beyond this, what implications would that have in my life and in how I spend my time and in how I spend my resources and in how I spend my talents and, and they didn't, they were not interested in that because they were doing very well. So now, now they come to him with this question. And, and Jesus says, your biggest problem is you can't imagine an afterlife that's different from the life you're living right now. You just transpose that whatever this is and you're benefiting, you just imagine, well, it can't be better than this, so must not exist.
Now, some people think that if you read the Bible and you believe in God, you have less imagination. I actually think the opposite is true. And so Jesus challenges them. And, and, and then he says this. He says, um, by the way, he did not say that we become angels. He said, you become like the angels. And he said, in heaven, there's not marriage or, or being given in marriage. And so now that creates a whole set of questions. So, well, if I'm married now, will I be married to the person when I get to heaven? I can tell you how my wife and I have resolved this. And what we have told each other is that when we get to heaven, if there is no marriage, we will be secretly married. <laughs> so please don't tell God. <laughs> See, angels, there are actually some people believe that when humans die, that's, that's, you become an angel. That's not how angels are created. By the way, angels also do not procreate, which is kind of the point that Jesus is saying. And none of the issues exist in heaven that would require this law regarding taking on your brother's wife as your own wife. None of those issues exist. You're not having to create a lineage. You're not having to create an inheritance. You're not having to make sure that the family wealth continues. None of those things exist in heaven. And yet that's the only way they can think about the resurrection because it's the only way they think, period. So we'll just start there. And then he says, have you not read? And now he quotes a verse of scripture that they do accept from Exodus, the third chapter. And, and God is talking to Moses at the burning bush. And he says, I am, right? When, when, when uh, Moses is going to go to release uh, all of the Israelites from Egypt in slavery, he asks them, when, when everybody asks, who, what is your name? Who sent me? God says, you just tell them I am. I am that I am. And here's God saying, I am what? The God of Abraham. I am the God of Jacob. I am the God of Isaac. He did not say, I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Isaac. I was the God of Jacob because they're dead now. And, and now I will be your God. That's not what he says. I am because he is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. And the Sadducees don't know what to say about that. And uh, he didn't convince them, but he did silence them. In fact, that's what we pick up in this next controversy, which is over priorities. In verse 34, it says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. It must have been like watching YouTube. Just channel after channel of controversy. And one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And Jesus responded to their question of the Pharisees with two texts from the Old Testament, one from Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, love the Lord your God, and then Leviticus, the 19th chapter, love your neighbor as yourself. Why is this important? Because when we love, we find a way, and when we don't love, we find an excuse. We, the, the big... The big push in our culture is for tolerance. As though this is some great value. Really? Is that all you want to be is tolerated? Our culture acts like that's, that's the greatest thing that, that could happen. And, and Jesus says, if you want to know what's really important, it's all about love, and it's loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. What's the most important? Loving God, loving others. Jesus is this incredibly God-centered person. And what's interesting is that then he says that all of the other laws... All of the other prophets hang on these two things. He's not just telling us this is the first law and then they follow. This is the most important law and they follow. He's telling us that this is the first law and 
every other law has to be interpreted through this law. It's amazing how bad some people's opinion is of God. If something goes wrong, he surely must be to blame. Tragedy comes into your life, what are people most likely to say? They'll, they'll ask, why is this happening? But right behind that question is, why is God doing this to me? What did I do to deserve this? And they see God as angry. They see God as punishing. And, and they see God as, as, as wanting to restrict and limit life rather than to help our lives to flourish. And so their opinion of God is very bad. And, and so what he says is the main reality is this, is that God is loving. And if you see every other commandment through this truth, it'll change how you read scripture. That's the lens. This is, you want to know why Jesus saw scripture differently? Because he actually knew his father. That's how he saw different, uh, scripture differently. So what does it do? When we, when we take these two commandments, it helps us know where to face, to face towards God, love the Lord your God, and it helps us know how we are to go about life, love your neighbor as yourself, because love for God is the best place to start if you want to love your neighbor. By the way, if you only love God and not your neighbor, you're more likely just to become a fanatic. And our world actually doesn't need a lot more of those. Make it personal. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, so <laughs> I don't know about you, but every once in a while I get perplexed about how I'm living out my faith and how much I think I know. And what I can tell you, the, the longer I'm in, in faith and the longer I'm in ministry, the more I realize there is just boatloads of stuff I don't know. And, and sometimes I get worried about it. Not that someone is going to ask me a question that I don't know the answer to, because I know how to respond to that. I don't know. That's, let's all practice that. Ready? I don't. It's absolutely beautiful. We don't have to know everything. But we are supposed to love, and this is what God says. God calls us to love people, love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Not who's someone who is like you, but someone who is near you. Who did God bring into your life today? How can you show love to them? It's amazing how we get caught up and we get worried about how we live out our faith. And by the way, love your neighbor as yourself. It's easier to love groups of people than it is to love a person. But well, there's no end to the people who just love the poor until they meet a poor person who needs something from them, right? Groups, and Jesus says, no, love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, somebody says, oh, that's, usually religious people will say this. That's, see, that's the problem with some churches. They just don't have any backbone anymore. They just won't tell the truth. They just compromise everything. Be very careful when you call compromise, when you call love compromise. Because Jesus said that's the most important thing. We should think about that. But secondly, what does love include? And if you go back to that same chapter in Leviticus 19 that Jesus quoted from, this is what it says in verse 16. He says, do not go about spreading slander among your people. Hmm. You know what slander is, right? Saying something that's not true about someone or putting them down. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate a fellow, a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. See, love sometimes includes a rebuke. Not because you're frustrated with them, but because you care for them. And you can tell when somebody rebukes you where they're coming from, can't you? Love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. See, self-love is a consequence of God's love for us. If you want, 
You know, we, we, we hear a lot about you need more self-esteem. If you want your self-esteem to get better, it won't come by looking in the mirror and telling yourself a bunch of good things about yourself. I mean, go for it. Try it. Um, and you'll feel a little bit better until someone else says something else. I, I was at a local grocery store here not long ago. I got out of my car and I'm walking towards the store and a person comes up to me and they said, Pastor Bob. And I said, hi. He said, I've not seen you in a long time. I said, that's true. He said, you got really old. <laughs> I could tell myself all day long, you're good looking. I don't, by the way, but I could. And all it takes is one person to say, you look really old. And, and so I hear that, I, I hear something else. I, other people tell me I look tired. And I have one or two responses that I use. You probably have heard it. One is, I've earned it. I'm tired because I work hard. And the other is, this is what old looks like on me. I'm actually not tired, I'm just old. The path to self-esteem, if it's just self-talk, will only last as long until someone else tells us something that didn't agree with what we told ourselves. But this is what's important. Our self-esteem is not in what I tell myself. It's in what God says about me. And we started our service this morning with it. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him might not perish and have eternal life. You want to know what you're worth? You're worth the one and only son of the living, loving God who gave him for us. That's what you're worth. So they're all done with their questions. And in fact, nobody's going to ask another question now. So Jesus asked a question. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they responded. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? Because he says, and he quotes from Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply to him. And from that day on, no one dared ask him any questions. Uh, David calls the Messiah Lord. And Jesus is not arguing here that the Messiah will not come from the line of David. That's not what he's saying. He's arguing that the Messiah is going to be different than David. David was a king, a political leader. And in our world, not just American culture, but in just about every culture you can imagine, the assumption is, is that if you get the right political leader, everything else would be better. And what Jesus is saying is, is that if all you're looking for is a political leader, all you're going to have is either the same problems or different problems. That what we actually need is something more. We need not just the son of David, we need the son of God. Our souls need more than a political leader. We need the son of God. Would you bow your heads and would the worship team come up? Uh, our world is filled full of uh, controversial things these days. And uh, they come so fast and furiously, it's hard to keep up with them. And the goal, as I said, is always disagreement, to see if we can get someone else to disagree with someone we disagree with. And what Jesus seems to be saying is it's, it's a lousy way to live. Stop trying to get Jesus to pick sides of a controversy you created. He's going to frustrate you. He's going to tell you to pay your taxes and he's going to tell you to give your whole heart to God. And for people who don't like God so much, that's hard to hear. And for people who don't like ta paying taxes, that's hard to hear. But Jesus didn't come just to pick sides. Jesus came to give us life. And so in our controversies, if we find ourselves so worked up all of the time, maybe, just maybe, it's because that we're not thinking about the kingdom of God 
and its righteousness. We're not thinking about God's Son and His love for us. We're not thinking about His amazing grace that's been made available to us. It may be the reason we're so anxious and we're so frustrated, we're so fearful, we're so, we're so agitated, is because we've lost sight. There's one among us, and his name is Jesus. And he hasn't come to choose a political party. Those things will fade away. He's not come to tell you that the thing that's most important to you is the most important to him. The things that you really value will fade away. What he's come to tell you is what really matters. Love God, love your neighbor, and that changes everything. So Heavenly Father, help us today not to choose sides, but to choose you. In Jesus' name, amen.